single thing that's out there. Yo, it's first contact with Joshua Bowen. He's the man on the mic, just in case you didn't know it. Covering news from all around the globe. From the weather in space to UFOs. He'll talk politics and make you open your eyes. Conspiracy theories and government lies. He'll dig it all up and try to find the proof. Cause it's time to demand the truth. It's time. First contact with the radio. We it's have time arrived. to demand the truth. First contact the radio, we it's have arrived. First contact time. radio. Good morning, Earthlings. How you doing today? Welcome back to First Contact Radio. Glad you could be here. Let's see where we're at. Today is the 5th of June, 2014. We have a Virgo moon. Okay, that's the first thing we're looking at. And we have a Gemini sun. So we look at those two things together. What we're wanting to figure out between the two of these is we're going to look at the elements, right? That's what we're looking at. It's Earth. Virgo is Earth. Um, Gemini is air. Earth is the form, the things that are created. Gemini, the air, the words, the actions we speak in order to be able to create the things that we want to create. So in the world, think how air and Earth works together. You could have the Earth and you could have the air blowing over it and it could create a big storm could blow the dust up around everything into the air and it can get, be a real mess. Hurricanes, things of this nature. Or it can be nice and smooth in the air. It can be nice and flowing over the land and provide a nice comfortable breeze. Okay, or the air doesn't have to blow at all. So if you think of it, the words, either the words are going to be overwhelming or they're going to be underwhelming because there's not going to be enough or there's just going to be the right amount. And that's what we're looking at with all of these, because you think of the tree of life, it has three pillars. And too much, too little, just right. And if we go through life kind of thinking in terms of the Goldilocks way, it kind of makes sense, because everything we do energetically, we're either going to be looking at doing it too much, or not enough, or just right amount. And that's what we're doing here. So we want to have a nice good balance between the earth, the form, the physical things in the world, and the words that we speak in order to bring those, the words and the actions. And when we balance out the air and the earth, it's always really good. It's when things become imbalanced that we have all these crazy storms and things. So things just to pay attention to. All right, so let's, let's look a little further here. All right, we have right up here things to, we're going to look at. We have this is a conjunction sign, which means that these are opposites from each other. So we have Virgo and it's opposite Neptune. Okay, you think of Neptune like the pitchfork here, the trident of Neptune. Okay, so the opposite. So Neptune is all about new perspectives on things. And so the Virgo, if you think of the keyword an analyst or to analyze, there's this idea of analysis taking place with looking at things from a new perspective and they're opposites each other. So when things are opposite each other, they, they kind of ground each other out. They balance each other. It's an, a balancing act that has to occur because you have you know two different ends, like on a teeter-totter. And you're trying to balance them out so they can both work together nice. Doesn't mean they both have to be in the same direction because you know a teeter-totter goes one side goes up, one goes down. Um, but you have both sides working harmoniously. So on one side we're the side of analysis, investigation, the other side of a new perspective. So in our investigations, we want to keep an open mind about what's going on. An open mind about the changes that are taking place, a new perspective we need to have. Because when we consider what's going on in the world, there's illusions that take place in the world. And we want to be able to see past the illusions that are out there. And the only way we can do that is to really kind of focus what we're looking at. Okay? And now, right here above that, or, or the next one over, excuse me, is the moon sign, Virgo, and it's in a trine with Venus. 
So we know a trine is a nice positive use of that energy. Um, nice good combination between them. So Virgo to analyze, to investigate, and Venus, love and imagination. Nice good positive thing. So we're investigating the ways in which we use our invest our imagination. We're analyzing that process. It's always important when we're analyzing things, we don't want to overanalyze because we have a tendency to do that, especially when we're working with the mind. We have Gemini right now is the sign that we're in, the sun sign. So our conscious mind is already in that place of communication, talking, thinking. It's a mental sign. And if our analysis becomes so extreme to one side, then it can drive us crazy. We don't want to do that. We don't want to drive ourselves crazy with too many questions. We want to find a way to use our analysis to our benefit. And so in this case, we're analyzing the love and the imagination that we have available to us. This is an aspect that's already taken place just, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, so we're already feeling the effect of that. A little bit later, we're going to be feeling another aspect going on, another trine. And this here is between Pluto. And Pluto is just like Neptune with the pitchfork or the, the trident. The only difference is you've got a little circle here above the middle one, above that middle prong. So you've got Pluto. Pluto is a planet that's way out there. So you think of the deep planet, the deep outer space. So if in our consciousness, that's something that's deep within our consciousness. And when it comes to the surface, there's a lot of change because something was buried down underneath that we didn't know it was there. Maybe we did know it was there, but we just pushed it away and buried it. There it is, and now it comes to the surface, and we need to analyze it. And again, with that nice, good trine energy, it means there's a positive analysis taking place and how we're going to look at the situation that is coming to the surface now. Uh, we have a square right here later this afternoon, and this is a square between the sun sign and the moon sign. So the sun sign is Gemini. The moon sign is Virgo. So these two lessons are going to square each other. So there's a lesson there between how our mind is working, how our words and our actions are being expressed from what our mind is thinking, and the analysis we're doing. So it says we don't want to overthink things, everything I've just been saying. We don't want to overanalyze a situation. We want to look at it. We want to be able to understand it. And then, of course, we want to be able to accept what is there. And that's part of the lesson, that when we get to a point of, of understanding that we accept what the situation is, we accept what the answer is so we can move forward. Otherwise, we're just going to keep analyzing and analyzing and analyzing. It doesn't do anybody any good. It certainly doesn't do us good individually if we're caught up in that wheel of over-analysis. Okay? And last thing we're going to look at today is tonight we have a sextile. And this is a, an opportunity. Um, that presents itself between these energies and here we have again Virgo sextile with Jupiter um, excuse me with Saturn Saturn's like this little letter H with the little cross above the top here Saturn discipline okay so there's a way in which our analysis is now finding a disciplined way in which to express itself Saturn is also representative of the last tarot card, which is the world, which is the energy that takes everything, recycles it, and puts it back into the world. And so we learn to see that when we go through looking at things from a new perspective, we analyze things. Sometimes we come out with answers that are really very helpful to who we are and what we're about because it allows us to be able to to understand more of who we are and that's really what this is all about understanding more of who we are okay so there you go for there a um, little bit deeper look at things or, or just more detailed look if we want to look at the ephemeris here the fifth we could see where anything is um, specific we need to be aware about you know everything for a lot of these planets stays the same you know things in some cases are moving slow so the moon moves fast every couple of days it changes Gemini, the sun changes once a month here we have uh, mercury as we could see it's about to go retrograde so remember when mercury goes retrograde the term retrograde retro means going back grade means another grade go back a grade go look at the things you've been doing 
It's not a time to start something brand new. The reason it's not a time to start something brand new is because Mercury is the mind, and the mind is now preoccupied with thinking about things that we have done in the past, looking, analyzing, figuring out if what we've done has been effective and how it's working. It's not a time to then start something new because our minds really aren't focused on the new and the energies that are around us aren't necessarily encouraging us to do something new. They're saying, go review what you've done, make sure it's right, make sure all your I's are dotted and all your T's are crossed, really double check things. So Mercury goes into retrograde, use that as a time to review work you've been doing. Look at what you've been doing up to this point in time and rather than starting something fresh, make your plans. Look at your work. Double check what you're doing. And when Mercury comes out of retrograde, when the mind is going back in a very clear direction, then move forward with the next phase. And you'll find that if you look and you understand the cycles that are going on and you work with these cycles, again, things become much more effective. All right. And Venus is in Taurus, which is where it should be. You know, it's a long time. It spends a whole long period of time, almost a month before it changes over. Mars is in Libra, where it is for all this month. So we know Libra is all about karmic balance, justice. Here we have a lot of energy within that area. Jupiter, which is like the number four here. Jupiter is in Cancer, which is an emotional sign, the home. Um, so there's an expansion in the home areas, expansion of our emotions. That's this entire month. Saturn is in a retrograde phase. So the ideas of discipline and everything, it's, it's gone backwards. So we revisit those ideas of how our lives are being disciplined. And we could see that it's moved into Scorpio, where it is for the rest of this month. So Scorpio is that sign that's all about change. It's represented in the tarot card of death. So we have this change going on and this discipline that's coming out of this change. So are we paying attention to what's taking place? You know, the, the, what the change is bringing? And are we disciplined enough to be able to learn from the changes so that we can move forward? And then we have Uranus. Uranus is like a, uh, I like to look at it like the Starship Enterprise. For all you Trekkies out there. And here it's in Aries. You can see Aries there, and it moves slow. It's going to be in Aries all this period of time, this whole month. And Uranus is unexpected changes that come about. Okay, so with these unexpected changes, they take place in the area of Aries, which is these pioneering efforts we have, organizational things to to move us forward. The the first card. Uh, the first sign of the zodiac is Aries. The Hebrew letter on it, hey, has to do with, it's a window. It's an opportunity. We look out the window. We put things in order. The meaning behind this card is he who sets in order. It's the conscious mind ordering, putting things in order for ourselves. And so all through this month, we're dealing with this changes that come out of this order. And then, of course, Neptune. And Neptune is in Pisces where it will be for the whole month, later this month. It's going to go into a retrograde grade phase for us to revisit some of these ideas that are going on. But Neptune is about looking at things from a new perspective. And it's in Pisces, so Pisces is dealing with emotions. Pisces is dealing with our spirituality. You know, the, the things that are really inside of us, those deep, meaningful things. And so we want to just make sure that when we're looking things, we're not unclear by our emotions. Pisces. I want to make sure, because think of Pisces. Pisces are the fish that swim in two different directions. So as the fish swim in two different directions, we want to make sure that we're not, uh, we certainly want to make sure that we are not at the mercy of the emotions. And so Neptune is saying, take a new perspective. Don't let your buttons be pushed. And the last one we're looking at here, Pluto. Pluto is just going into Cap or is in Capricorn, you can see right here, and it's retrograde. So we're revisiting some of those deep ideas that are buried within us. Sometimes we don't always acknowledge them, but when we do, we start to understand that they do make sense. 
And so Pluto's in this phase for a long period of time, the whole rest of this month. So you can see that there are certain signs that last a long time. The planets get into these different signs and they last great periods of time. Some of them move quick, some of them move slow, just depending on how they go. And then, of course, I'm leaving the wheel up here so you can see. So whenever you look at there's, you know, for example, you know, uh, Gemini or today the moon is in uh, in Virgo we're looking right over here so you just take the particular planet and look at where it is and that way you can kind of place it in the chart here and see where it fits what house it's dealing with and of course you can look each of these houses has a planet in it so this is their strong point when they're here but they, they do move around Numerology for today is number nine. Number nine. Number nine. And here we go. We have six plus five plus two zero one four. In other words, we have an eighteen. Six plus five plus seven. One plus eight equals nine. And the process of theosophic subtraction brings us to the number nine, which is we've been talking about this quite a bit. It's also Virgo, Virgo, the hermit, okay? This is the hand, the helping hand, the yod, that helps us out. The hermit's holding the lantern high for others to see because the hermit went into solitude to figure things out. And in figuring things out, now the hermit is coming out with the lantern saying, aha, I figured out what needs to happen. I figured out, and now I'm going to hold this lantern so others can see as well. So the hermit's a leader. Hermit is also an aspect of Mercury, but it's kind of taken the mind to the next level because we're looking at the mind, but then we find a way to really bring all these things together in a practical sort of way. So the idea that we have Mercury and Virgo today going on, and they both are kind of aspects of each other to some degree, there's a lot of uh, synchronicity and similarity with these ideas. What we're going to communicate sometimes has to come from what we understand that's buried within ourselves. Okay, and let's take a look at the Tree of Life to see these placements. Okay, we've got the Hermit, our numerology for today coming from here. So we've learned things. We understand the humility of what we've learned because it's important. Now we're going to take that lesson to the heart. We've got the Gemini coming from over here just like yesterday from what we understand back to the heart as well all right I want to add in this other chart for you this is uh, another keyword chart so as we're looking at uh, these the hermit here tells us the, the note if you want to use this musically to play it it's always a cool thing to do but yod yod is the Hebrew letter these are the Hebrew letters assigned to them yod means open hand okay so and it's the symbol of Virgo Gemini right here Zion is sword and so this is a nice good chart here just to look at the keywords again keywords are very important and sometimes just knowing that one keyword for each particular symbol or sign is very helpful to help you understand exactly what it is that you're trying to figure out We've arrived at the first quarter of a waxing moon, which means we're going up to the full moon. First quarter means we've made it halfway between the new moon and the full moon. When we look up into the sky tonight, it says uh, first quarter moon. The moon shines below the hind foot of Leo this evening. So this is where it was yesterday in the fourth, so it's even progressed a little bit more. So... We know Leo is here. It's going to be way over. Now Leo is going to be here, but the moon's going to be over a bit more. So we'll look way to the right. We'll see the Leo. The moon shines below the hind foot of Leo this evening. Cassiopeia usually means cold. Late fall and winter are when the landmark constellation is high overhead. But even on warm June evenings, it's lurking now. After dark, look for it down near the north horizon. It's a wide, upright W. The further north you are, the higher it will appear. But even as far south as San Diego and Atlanta, it's completely above the true horizon. All right.
The Mayan Oracle read a ten tone day. Tens are called the planetary tone of manifestation. So it's a day of manifestation according to this cycle and this tone. We're on the wave spell here of the moon, purification, the theme of the moon and purification. Today we're at this point here of the reflection, endless reflection of our own purification. The kin for today, the day that we relate to, it's called the kin because we relate to each day. It's our relation. When we understand our relation with the day and the energies, it's very helpful to us. Here we have the mirror, which is the reflection of endlessness, and it's guided by death power of understanding the difference between life and death. So today would be the planetary, the manifestation of endlessness guided by death. The phrase for today is I perfect in order to reflect, producing order. I seal the matrix of endlessness with the planetary tone of manifestation. I am guided by the power of death. And our Zulkin here is where we are, three columns over, three rows up, which means there's a connection here synchronicity point between these two and this is why it's a galactic activation portal day. Spaceweather.com solar wind is 342.0 kilometers per second. Our planetary K index is quiet at the moment as a 2. Still the big corona hold down here but nothing reported yet of anything blowing our way. M class flare dropped down to 10%, X class to 1. Geomagnetic storm activity is dropping down as well. It was up in the 20s and even a 30 in the high latitudes, but you could see it's quite low. Today in the Jewish calendar, it is the second day of Shavat. It is the day called Seven Sivan. We look over here for the daily thought for today. The Torah we were given is not of this world, nor is it something extraneous to it. Rather, it is a hidden essence, the primal thought form, which all the cosmos and each thing within it extends. It is not about this world, it is the world, the world as the Creator sees it and knows it to be. The sages of the Talmud told us that the Torah is the blueprint God used to design His creation. There is not a thing that cannot be found there. Even more, they told us the Torah is far beyond this world, beyond time, beyond any sort of being. God and His Torah are one. For his thoughts are not extraneous to him, nor do they affect any change in him as our thoughts do. Rather, his thoughts, his wisdom, his desire are all simple oneness that does not change. But he took that infinite wisdom and condensed it a thousandfold, a billionfold, and more to infinite earthly items that we could grasp, yet without losing a drop of its purity, its intimate bond with him. Then he put it into our hands to learn, to explore, and to extend. So now, with our minds, grasps the thought of Torah. Thoroughly, with utter clarity, we grasp the inner wisdom, and when we are completely absorbed in the process of thought, comprehension, and application, our self and being is grasped by that infinite wisdom, which is the essence of all things. We have grasped it, and, gra and it grasps us. In truth, we become that essence. Well, kind of the idea of the, uh, the hermit here, sort of implied there, the idea of the grasping, you got the hand. The hermit has the hand, he's learned. He's grasped the wisdom, and now he's going to share it with others. Okay, so there's all connections between all of this if you look for them. And here we could see the uh, Shavat calendar here. It just shows the readings for today. Huh. It says the Torah reading is Deuteronomy and Numbers, and uh, holiday ends tonight at nightfall. Let's just take a quick look at Deuteronomy 15:19. Okay. It says, every firstborn male that is born of your cattle, of your, of your flock, you shall sanctify to the Lord your God. You shall neither work with the firstborn of your ox, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You shall eat it before your Lord your God, year by year in the place the Lord chooses you and your household. All right. All right, there you go. So that is what's going on. Get things started. UFO News is up next. Let's get to it. This is the UFO News with Joshua Poet. All right, Dirk, thank you very much. First sighting takes us to Rome, Italy. 
fleet of orbs over Rome the 1st of June. Here we got three of them circled here for you to see. Make the witnesses checking it out. UFO conference was being held in Rome this week, and as it were, as we were walking outside, a fleet of white cloud orbs came to greet them. Okay. These orbs have the ability to sense a person's emotions and record them. All right, the video itself, 7 minutes and 30 seconds in length. It's always a good confirmation. There you go. There's the orbs right there. It's always a good confirmation. You see this. Here's these people at the conference. They go out, and there you go. All right, pretty cool. Moving from Italy, we're going to go over to France. Takes about 10 to 20 seconds before the video starts to show a clear UFO image. Okay, there's the first thing. It looks like a little fire in the sky, doesn't it? Actually, a big fire. But as it starts to clear up, you get a better idea that it's a series of lights. Pretty cool. Just imagine how bright those lights need to be to be shining like that, that high up. Okay, it's a minute and 38 seconds for the video, but I'm going to leave that to you to continue on. And the next story takes us northern beaches. UFO sighting in D.Y. Early morning walkers witness strange disc-like object in the sky. Was the strange light hovering in the sky over D.Y. Beach on Wednesday morning a UFO? Local resident Don Jeffrey said it definitely wasn't a plane and was open to the idea that it was a UFO. Mr. Jeffrey, who goes for a 20-kilometer walks before every morning, before work every morning, noticed a large gathering of people on the beach promenade at about 6.35 a.m. A lot of people were gazing skywards, about 20 or 30, and I asked what it was, he said. Some of them thought it could be a UFO. Another person suggested it was a plane coming into land, but I stayed in the same spot for 10 to 20 minutes, and it looked like it had a tail. Here's our object right here. I took three photos, but I didn't think much about it until I came home from work and enlarged the photo on my computer. It's brighter than the sun, and it looked like a disc, like a disc-like object. I've never seen anything like it before. I like to keep an open mind, and with all those galaxies out there, I think there must be other life. Okay. And this is a site called NUFOC. I know we've been here before, National UFO Reporting Center. Thought we'd check this out today. Just click here to enter the site. And once you click on that button, it takes you. All right, come on now. It's taking just a little extra time, apparently. Obviously, they're busy. It wasn't like this before. Let's see here. Okay, here we go. All right. I uh, got to the reports by the month. We're going to look at the reports here for the month of June. What we see is here a whole list of sightings so far this month. Most recent one was on the 4th. We have strange high pitched sounds in the sky out of Rancho Bernardo, California. Columbus, Ohio, high altitude bright light traveling, very erratic path. In Missouri, Starkville spotted what looked like the ISS over Starkville, Missouri, about 15 minutes past midnight. Richmond, Virginia, while on my part apartment, I noticed two large white lights, what looked like an airplane, running lights. So on and on. So this is a good place to go if you just want to have a good compilation of everything that's going on for the course of the month. And of course, if we backtrack one, we could see that here we have all the months. So it has all the months that are here, and then how many sightings took place for that month. So you can go all the way back for a long period of time, back to 1400, June of 1400 for a sighting back there. All right, so lots of great information here. Check this out. It's a good resource. And then the very last one is a piece, it's a video for you to watch. It's called Origins of the Majestic 12 Documents. 
You've heard of these groups, the Majestic Twelve. The origins of the Majestic Twelve documents has its roots in a complicated set of events that included disinformation, hoaxes, and lies. For this reason, most of this history has been lost or is glossed over. However, the true origins of the documents and how UFO researchers came to know the term Majestic Twelve is important when assessing their legitimacy. We have taken months to investigate this story, which has included working with the Public Relations Department of the U.S. Air Force Office of Special Investigations. While an investigation is ongoing, in this video we share with you what we have found thus far. So again, uh, 29 minutes, 14 seconds. Check it out. Learn more about MJ-12, what they were all about, how they came into being, and all of that wonderful good stuff. All right, that is our UFO news. I'm going to jump away about a minute or so, maybe less, and we're going to continue on. Stay tuned. Come into our circle, great spirit. Fill our souls with peace. brain pretty powerful right well according to this article here it says the brain may be able to repair itself from within Duke researchers have found a new type of neuron in the adult brain that is capable of telling stem cells to make more neurons though the experiments are in the early stages the finding opens the tantalizing possibility that the brain may be able to repair itself from within neuroscientists have suspected for some time that the brain has the capacity to direct the manufacturing of new neurons, but it was difficult to determine where these instructions are coming from. Explain Chao Kiao, Che Kiao, uh, an associate professor of cell biology, neurobiology, and pediatrics. In a study with mice, the team has found a previously unknown population of neurons within the subventicular zone neurogenic niche of the adult brain adjacent to the striatum. These neurons expressed the chlorine acetyltransferase enzyme, otherwise known as CHAT, which is required to make the neurotransmitter acetylchlorine with optogenic tools that allow the team to tune the firing frequency of these CHAT plus neurons up and down with laser light, they were able to see clear changes in neural stem cell proliferation in the brain. The finding appears in advance in online publication in the Journal of Neuroscience. It's pretty fascinating. So perhaps all those stories of, you know, those br killing all the brain cells, maybe the brain heals itself. I mean, just think, you know, there's people that go out and they spend a lot of time drinking, 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 killing the brain cells. You know, people drink for a long time and go years and years and years. Despite the fact that the brain cells that might be getting killed off, maybe there's something that's rebuilding them. Maybe that's just a normal process and everything. So that's pretty cool to see. Again, it's interesting, all these advances in science that we're seeing. Definitely is interesting. All right. Thursdays have become like Buddha Thursdays. And I've been reading from the site and all about the from Buddhist ethics to the basic principles and so on. Well today I'm going to read you 
from Buddha's first sermon. Okay? This is the first sermon. So setting in motion the wheel of truth, the first sermon of the Buddha. For seven weeks, immediately following the enlightenment, the Buddha spent his time in lonely retreat. At the close of this period, he decided to proclaim the doctrine of Dhamma. He had realized to those five ascetics who were once struggling with him for enlightenment, knowing that they were living at Ispatana, which is modern Samath, still steeped in the unmeaning rigors of extreme asceticism, the master left Gaya, where he attained enlightenment, for distant Varanasi, India's holy city, there at Deer Park, he rejoined them. Thus I have heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Deer Park at Ispatana, the resort of the seers near Varanasi, or Benares. Then he addressed a group of five monks, known as Bikos. Monks. These two extremes ought not to be practiced by one who has gone forth from the household life. What are the two? There is addiction to indulgence of sense pleasures, which is low, coarse, in the way of ordinary people, unworthy and unprofitable. And there is addiction to self-mortification, which is painful, unworthy and unprofitable. Avoiding both these extremes, the, the Tathagata, or perfect one, has realized the middle path, it gives vision, gives knowledge, and leads to calm, to insight, to enlightenment, and to nirvana. And what is the middle path realized by, by the Tathagata? It is the noble eightfold path, and nothing else, namely, right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This is the middle path realized by the Tathagata which gives vision, which gives knowledge, and leads to calm, to insight, to enlightenment, and to nibbana. The noble truth of suffering, dukkha, monks, is the birth, is this. Birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Sickness is suffering. Death is suffering. Association with the unpleasant is suffering. Associate, disassociation from the pleasant is suffering. And to receive what one desires is suffering. In brief, the five aggregates subject to grasping our suffering. The noble truth of the origin, cause of suffering, is this. It is the craving or the thirst which produces rebecoming rebirth accompanied by passionate greed and finding fresh delight here and now, now here, namely craving for sense pleasures, craving for existence and craving for non-existence. The noble truth of cessation of suffering is this. It is the complete cessation of that very craving, giving it up relinquishing it, liberating oneself from it, and detaching oneself from it. The noble truth, truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering is this. It is a noble eightfold path and nothing else, namely right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This is the noble truth of suffering, such as was the vision, the knowledge, the wisdom, and the science, the light that arose in the morning, in me concerning things not heard before. The suffering as a noble truth should be fully realized. Such was the vision, the knowledge, the wisdom, the science, the light that arose in me concerning things not heard before. This suffering as a noble truth has been realized. Such was the vision, the knowledge, the wisdom, the science, the light that arose in me concerning things not heard before. This is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. Such was the wisdom the knowledge, the wisdom, the science, the light that arose in me concerning things not heard before. The origin of suffering as a noble truth should be eradicated. Such was the vision, the knowledge, the wisdom, the science, the light that arose in me concerning things not heard before. The origin of suffering as a noble truth has been eradicated. Such was the vision, the knowledge, the wisdom, the science, the light that arose in me concerning things not heard before. This is the noble truth of cessation of suffering. Such was the vision, the knowledge, the wisdom, the science, the light that arose in me concerning such things not heard before. This cessation of, liberating, cessation of suffering as a noble truth should be realized. Such was the vision, the knowledge, the wisdom, the science, and the light that arose in me concerning things not heard before. This cessation of suffering as a noble truth has been realized. Such was the vision, the knowledge, the wisdom, the science, the light that arose in me concerning things not heard before. 
This is the noble truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Such was the wisdom, the knowledge, the vision, the science, the light that arose in me concerning things not heard before. This path leading to the cessation of suffering as a noble truth should be developed. Such was the vision, the wisdom, the knowledge, the science, and the light that arose in me concerning things not heard before. This path leading to the cessation of suffering as a noble truth has been developed. Such was the vision, the knowledge, the wisdom, the science, the light that arose in me concerning things not heard before. As long as my knowledge of seeing things as they really are was not quite clear in these three aspects, in these twelve ways, concerning the four noble truths, I did not claim to have realized the matchless supreme enlightenment in this world with its gods, with its maras and brahmas, in this generation with its recluses and brahmans, with its divas and humans. But when my knowledge of seeing things as they really are was quite clear in these three aspects, in these twelve ways concerning the Four Noble Truths, then I claim to have realized the matchless supreme enlightenment in this world with its gods, with its maras and brahmas, in this generation with its recluses and brahmans, with its devas and humans. And a vision of insight arose in me thus, unshakable is my deliverance of my heart, this is my last birth, there is no more rebecoming. This is thus the Blessed One said, the group of five monks were glad, and they rejoiced at the words of the Blessed One. When the discourse was thus expounded, there arose in the venerable Kondana a passion-free, stainless vision of truth. In other words, he attained Sopati, the first stage of sanctity, and realized whatever has the nature of arising has the nature of ceasing. And when the Blessed One set in motion the wheel of truth, the Bhumata Devas, or the earth deities proclaimed the matchless wheel of truth that cannot be set in motion by recluse, brahmana, deva, mara, brahma, or any one in the world is set in motion by the blessed one in the dear park, it is a patana near Varanasi. Hearing these words of the earth deities, all the Gautama Marahajaka divas proclaimed the matchless wheel of truth that cannot be set in motion by recluse, Brahman, Deva, Mara, Brahma, or anyone in the world is set in motion by the Blessed One in Deer Park at the Ispitana near Varanasi. These words were heard in the Upper Deva Realms and from Kata Maharjakta it is proclaimed in Tavatimasa Yamatusita Nimanarati Purana Nimita Vasavati and the Brahmins of Brahman Panasaja, Brahma Pohicha, Mahabrahman, Parita, Apanmabra, Abrahasara, Paritita Sabha, Apamana Subha, Sabha Kina, Veyaha Pahala, Avita, Pata, Sudasa, Sudasi, and in Akanitita, the matchless wheel of truth that cannot be set in motion by recluse Brahma, Deva, Mara, Brahma, or anyone in the world is set in motion by the Blessed One in the Deer Park at the Ispatana near Varanasi. Thus at that very moment, at that instant, the cry that the wheel of truth is set in motion spread as far as the Brahman realm. The system of ten thousand worlds trembled and quaked and shook. The boundless sublime radiance surpassing the effluence of devas appeared in the world. Then the Blessed One uttered the pageant of joy. Verily Kandana has realized, verily Kandana has realized the Four Noble Truths. Thus it was that the Venerable Kandana received the name Ana Kandana, Kandana who realizes. With the proclamation of the Dhamma for the first time, and with the conversion of the five ascetics, the Deer Park at Ispatana became the birthplace of Buddha's dispensation and the Sangha, the community of monks, the ordained dis disciples. Emperor Kaso, 281 years after the event, came to the pilgrimage to this holy spot and caused a series of monuments and commemorative pillar with the lion capital to, to be erected. This capital, with its four magnificent lions upholding the Dhamma Karka, the Wheel of Dharma, now stands in the Museum of Samoth. 
and is today the official crest of India. The Dhammakya Kakra festival is still maintained in Sri Lanka. Jarawala Nehru, the late Prime Minister of India, writes, Al Samath near Benes, I would almost see the Buddha preaching the first sermon, and some of his recorded words would come like a distant echo to me through the 2,500 years. Ahsoka's pillars of stone with their inscriptions would speak to me in the magnificent language and tell me of the man who, though an emperor, was greater than any king or emperor. Okay? So there you have it. It's quite a lot there, quite, quite a tongue twister. I hope I pronounced some of those words right. I'm not sure if I did or not, but you get the idea. And when I hear the words of the Buddha and the teachings that Buddha had to say, I find a lot of synchronicity between other teachings. Certainly there's a synchronicity between the teachings of Buddha and Jesus. And as we understand about Jesus during his time when he was out in the world, during those years where he was missing, or that is not recorded in the Bible, we are told that he was studying the works of Buddha, amongst other studies. So there is a lot of synchronicity here. You hear Buddha talking about the middle path, just like in Kabbalah talks about the middle path. And what he was seeing wasn't something that was hidden from everybody. He wasn't seeing something that was only for the Buddha to see. He was seeing what is really going on in the world around us. And he was explaining it, putting it in terms to under for people around him to understand. And that's what his words are about, this path that we're following, this understanding, how we can all attain this state of enlightenment. There was never a time where the Buddha, as far as I'm aware, was saying that this was something only for him, but it was for all to learn, to evolve, to be a part of. And as we continue to grow and learn, we follow that middle path. We gain the enlightenment that we're looking for. Okay? Okay. Let's move on. I have an article here from In5D. This one is called Manifesting Our Reality with Sacred Geometry. Nothing ever goes away until it teaches us what we need to know. Pema Chodan. It's an article by Kim Caldwell. We are living in a multi-dimensional universe experience. What we are seeing and experiencing here on our Earth life is but a minuscule part of the vast and exciting world we are actually experiencing. We may bring some of this magic into our lives by visualizing and working with sacred geometry. Here are just a few examples of shapes and the energies we create with. Cubes contain energy and cones pull energy in. If we add color to these visualizations, we may give it another dimension and more creating power. For example, we may throw a blue cube around someone who is upset or angry to help calm them and transmute any negative heavy energies. A student may create a yellow cylinder around them during a test for a more relaxed and quiet appearance. experience. The principles of sacred geometry are ancient yet simple. We may use sacred geometry any time we become conscious to create a better and more delicious reality. Enjoy the video below for further exploration. The video is also filled and blessed with healing dolphin frequencies for you. Okay. And so it's a nice good video, 9 minutes, 55 seconds. I'm going to leave the video for you to watch. We have a website for Kim Caldwell. She says, author of Green Smoothie, Save My Life, Activate Your Abundance, and the Abundance Meditations audio program. And her website's togetherpublishing.com. All right, so yeah, sacred geometry is very important. You know, if you just think about it, go back to the idea, everything is energy, okay? Energy can be moved around. We move it around every day. We move through energy. And over the course of time, those who have looked at energy noticed that there are symbols and shapes that are part of the energy. And so it's not that people just made these things up. It's that those who were looking at the energy fields around us started seeing these energy patterns there. And so in seeing these patterns and then understanding them and then charting them out, drawing them, we be begin to see that some energy is like a square, some energy is like a triangle, some are like full cubes, not just squares or pyramids or cones or all the different shapes that we out there, circles. And as we learn to work with these energies, we learn to understand that it's just ways in which energy is moving around. We even 
if you even look at the healing arts or the magical practices you have instances where those are drawing things with their fingers or their hands and they're moving energy around that's what they're doing they're just moving energy and so over a period of time when someone has done a a, a uh, gesture with their hands where they're moving energy in a certain way there is some meaning that becomes attached to that okay when you're drawing a circle with there we all understand what that represents we understand that there's a way of moving that energy around and as we learn to move energy around in different ways we find that we can be more effective we can help ourselves as the show this article is talking about we learn to be able to use the energy of life to accentuate it around ourselves or others to help us accentuate the life that we're trying to live all right not too difficult once we really look at it it just seems a little bit more difficult at first until we step in and say oh that's pretty easy because it all goes back to what Jesus said you must be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven well if that's the case then none of this should be complicated it should all be very very simple all right all right let's move on to our channeled message for today this one comes to us from the immortals here we go holy ones we speak unto one and we speak unto all as we commence for the highest and best of all and we should say this always so that the word should be carried through all dimensions and through all beings beings of light energy workers immortals come forth then we speak to an immortals let's speak to the immortals without thought without words and how do we do this by silencing ourselves and in harmony with all ourselves and speaking and not words for the greater knowing of all humanity no for the greater knowing of our creation as well how many we are we are the immortal so we simply take that name for the greater knowing of all and the highest best and we represent ourselves as, as this way the immortals we are not here to assist or guide for that is the compliance of the archangels angels within the realm of law to assist and guide is that is their divine obligation obligation that is divine that they chosen to take consciously taking and in gratitude they said yes that is what they are to serve and assist the angelic realm and the immortals as immortals that we have always been we have always been and those beyond the frequencies and anything that can be indescribable or we will describe it this way so not only that humanity but all dimensions will be able not to conceive but to know that the immortals are within multi dimensions Okay, an immortal who presents himself, and you will see, you will speak, and it has been spoken. We sometimes often speak to humanity as human form, and we have done this often within the third dimensional world, or vibrating the fifth dimensional frequency beyond even the fifth dimension. We say these numbers just for the sake of the knowing of humanity. The immortals, as light beings have come upon now to unite all creation in, in harmony the dismay of, of and the disharmony and the thought forms so they can be transformed into the greater light so there has been spoken and it has been asked and the brother the one that he take his name and they say his name is Matt his name is no longer Matt to us he's a one that covers words he's the one that takes the words and the visions and the speakings and the teachings and the dialogues to the masses masses when we say the masses again don't think humanity that is we speaking to you 
because it is not to you that we speak, we speak to our creation. And the more we speak to our creation, and we should speak to our creation, always that we have always been. We have always been, and all the wisdom teachings that we have, that we have not come here to teach, we have revealed to all, all beings, in all dimensions. And there is a purpose, a purpose for all that is said and done. So the purpose that we are here to that we can come and we take form and we occupy form in humanity and there are many. Okay, for example, the prophets, the prophets. The prophets again shall come and we as immortals should be those prophets. Prophesize what? If all is complete in hope, what should be prophesized? It is not to prophesize, to uh, foresee, but to see that, that that cannot be seen. And that's the totality of our creation, to be in equilibrium in its totality in all dimensions, to be one love, one, no longer one humanity, but one creation. But within, it is within the light beings that are here recited, are assisting those souls so they can comply with the divine obligation and their soul evolution. Now, the immortals are here and we shall present ourselves. How should we present ourselves? You will know. And only you, light beings who appear at heart, shall know. It is not that the others are neglected or there are less to be in contact with these immortals. It is that we within ourselves and we should reveal to those here are present, here are present, here now, and the here now within this dimension, we are also immortals. And now we're recalling ourselves as that. All right, very nice. Nice message. And uh, let's move on. Take the idea there of the immortals that, you know, this immortal life, this immortal energy is a part of who we are, what we're about, and as we tap into it, as we tap into a bigger part of ourselves, we begin to understand and experience something a bit more than what we realized. So let's get to our meditation, take a deep breath, and exhale, take another deep breath, and exhale again. One more deep breath and exhale. Contemplate the words of this affirmation. I am superior to negative thoughts in low actions. I am superior to negative thoughts in low actions. And we just contemplate that idea and we understand that we who are connected to immortality, to divinity, to life that goes on and on is bigger than all negativities and doubts and fears. And when we allow ourselves to take a deeper perspective, a further, another perspective, we see things clearer. So I want you to imagine yourself now standing on the earth and you see life around you, situations in life around you. And then I want you to imagine as if you are filled with helium that you slowly begin rising off of the earth. And as you begin pulling away from the earth and drifting higher and higher, your perspective changes and the things you were looking at become smaller. And the more you continue to drift upward, the more that the things look smaller and smaller until pretty soon you are off the planet looking down at the earth and you realize how small and insignificant some of the things really are. And as you float higher and higher through the cosmos and the planets and the stars, you see and understand the immortality, the divinity that exists in all things. And you realize that simply by changing our perspective from one where we are so close to one where we step back, we see things in a different way. It helps us to realize how we've been caught up in a situation. And if we are caught up, we can certainly release by simply letting go. And so we let go. 
we let God we trust that in the process of letting go and letting God that we will see things clearer and that trust is met with truthfulness for we do see things clearer and in this clarity we understand more of who we are what we are why we are so imagine yourself going through the world today looking at things from the perspective of what's going on here and then from the further perspective of how these things fit into the big picture and as we contemplate the big picture and our place in it we begin to find out exactly how we fit and whether or not this vision of how we're supposed to fit matches with what we know now doesn't matter for in an instant all can change we just simply need to open our mind to understand the changes and then be willing to accept the changes that want to take place in our lives so just imagine these changes imagine your life changing for the better simply because you take a new perspective on things so as you go into the world today just imagine looking at everything from a new perspective seeing if you can find a way to look at something differently to maybe learn something you hadn't seen before and as your subconscious mind continues and just keeps looking for new perspectives let's bring our conscious mind back to the present moment on the count of three three coming back to the present moment filled with confidence two coming back to the present moment filled with faith and one coming back to the present moment happy healthy and whole happy healthy and whole take another deep breath exhale and open your eyes that's it my friends that's our show for today thank you very much for being here lots of good information for all of us I hope you get from the show as much as I get from it because I learned from all of these different uh, different things that we go over so thanks for being here I appreciate it have an awesome day tomorrow we're going to tomorrow's Jesus Friday and uh, got a nice good schedule here now Mondays is kind of open Tuesdays and Wednesdays book your rancha Thursday will be Buddha Thursday and Friday will be Jesus Friday and we're going to continue that on so stay tuned for more information and more uh, more first contact coming your way thanks for being here I love you talk to you tomorrow peace I'm out of here